always ready for something that's going to happen out of the realm of possibility. Good morning, church. Welcome to Encompass Everywhere here in Encompass on the second floor of the Winnipeg Chinese Alliance Church in downtown Winnipeg, where it's bright and sunny out. The Jets have clinched a playoff berth. It's wonderful to hear. Well, this means nothing to do with worshiping God. But, uh, but th and you definitely know that spring is here because the allergies are starting to ramp up. I was speaking with a person the other day. They came from Toronto. They've never been to Winnipeg. They're coming here for a job. And they said, what is with my allergies? I've never had it like this before. I says, welcome to the allergy season. And what it is, you know, for some, because there's nothing blooming outside, right? There's no bloom. But it's all that kind of detritus, you know, all the, all the leaves have been crushed by the ice, and then there's that freeze thaw, and little microparticles of mold that kind of float around. We call that snow mold. And it makes this person from Toronto feel like so icky. And I said, no, no, we're going to be fine. We're going to be fine, because this is Winnipeg. We will win. Winnipeg. Get it? Just remember that. <laughs> anyway, my name is Nobby. Nice to see you all uh, here to worship. Uh, welcome to this lovely day that the Lord has blessed us with. Please stand for the call to worship. The call to worship is taken from Acts chapter 2, verses 17 to 21, which in itself is a paraphrase of something that happens in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32, and Peter is addressing the crowd, because they're all wondering, what the heck's going on? Why are all these people doing these weird things? And he said, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will turn to darkness and the moon to blood. Tomorrow's eclipse, by the way. And before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Let us continue worshiping the Lord God with songs of worship.
blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face
fue imposible. The Lord calls each and every one of us to have a relationship with him. And the way he calls each and every one of us is a little different and a little special because that invitation is just meant for you. This past week, uh, I had the opportunity to take a week off from work, coinciding with Easter. And it was refreshing because I missed that opportunity to be with God on a daily basis. Shoulda, woulda, coulda, right? All these things where people tell you, oh, yeah, make sure you take this time with you in a day. And that's just, uh, da, 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 da. But the problem is, is that when you live in a life which is constantly a go, 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 taking another moment to stop seems counterintuitive because it's sort of like I've got so much on my plate. And for those who do, don't know, right, I work in a hospital. It's very busy. There's lots of stuff coming in through the door. And Jesus did say to us that the poor you will always have with you. But he could have easily said, the sick you will always have with you. And even if they're not physically sick, they are emotionally sick. And I'm not meaning mentally ill, just worrying. And Christ has said to us, don't worry. So this past week, I've made it, and it's fortunate I have a, you know, we have the version app, many of us do. It's something that encourages us just to take five minutes to do this. It's just simple. But actually forcing yourself, the me of this earth, to stop and talk to the me who was saved and say, hey, I got to stop and allow you, who's the same person, by the way, to talk with God. And the Lord's been very gracious this past week. So with that in mind, let us pray. Gracious Lord, you are a good, good Father. You love us. You love us so much that you sacrificed all that you were, the maj majesty of who you were, to come down here and suffer the most humiliating, shameful death possible embarrassing, totally disrespectful. But you did it because you invited each of us to have a relationship with you. And you did it because you care and love each one of us. And in this world when we see so much wrong going on and we don't know what to do, please send the Spirit to move our hearts so that we don't look away from the trauma, but learn to ask, what can I do? When we see the homeless person on the street, rather than turn away and say, if I ignore them, they will just go out of sight and be like a little six-month-old. Allow us to ask this question. Allow the question to surface and bubble up to the surface. Say, Lord, what can I do? Can I help them? Do I have loose change? Can I talk to them? Can I find out how they're doing? When someone calls and we're tired of listening to them because they're constantly phoning us and constantly dragging us down, constantly taking me away from all the other busy things in my life, oh Lord, allow me that, that, that spirit of peace so that I can spend a little bit of time with them, that I can help them see you that I can be Jesus with skin on. Allow me, Lord, to serve you by serving the people around us because you asked us to, because you commanded us to. You asked us to love the world. And even though the world may not love us, what we do. Because we are sacrificing ourselves for your kingdom You've already said that we have received treasure in heaven far more abundant 
than anything we could ever hear, have here on earth. So thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for the encouragement that you give us day to day. For those here who feel a bit distant because they're just so caught up with their daily lives, I pray that you, you continue to yearn and call to them through the Spirit. Give them an example or some circumstance that just draws them back to you. Because truly, that's the reason why you came for each one of us. And because of our love for you, how could we not want to serve those around? We thank you, Lord, for, for your sacrifice. You truly are a good, good father. I had a little note here that said that I was supposed to pray for the offering, but I kind of figured that, that you guys kind of got the idea from that. Make sure you do offer, tithe. If you're working and you haven't figured out that, oh, this is a blessing from God, it is, consider giving a portion of what you earn to God, through the church. It doesn't have to be through the church. If you really don't want to give it to the church, you should, because it helps the ministry grow. It helps the fact that there are physical bills that have to be paid. I don't want to get into all that kind of silly stuff. But the truth is the Lord calls us to give, because all of it has been given to you to manage while you're here, because you can't take it with you. There's only one thing that you can take when you go to heaven and that is your relationships. Anything else doesn't make a difference. You can look online. There's a, um, a comedian back in the 90s, um, a very famous one by the name of Jim Carrey, and he's reached the highest heights, and he'll tell you that this is all meaningless. I've had and seen it all, he said. I realize that there's only one thing I lack, and that is to give all and serve him. Look it up. I'm not telling you anything that you wouldn't have already seen. Are you on the internet? Do that. Go look up Jim Carrey on your own time, by the way. Right now it's service. So here we have space for God. It's an opportunity for anyone that feels that they have a message that they want to share with the group here. It's not meant for you personally. It is. But at the same time, every time you receive a message from God, it is for the church. And the church is not the building, but the church is the people. It's meant for all of us. We learn by, through your example, we learn through an opportunity that someone has shared their testimony. And the testimony is not just how I came to Christ, but certainly day-to-day -day activities, like me telling you that I've taken a week off because I just needed to. And then I realize that I missed communing with God on a daily basis. And hopefully this is a good habit for me to keep going. But it shouldn't be a habit. It's basically God telling me that I want to talk to you. So come chat with me. And so we leave this time now for you to come up, if you wish. Shalom, dear church. Mm, I would like to. I would like to sharing a one small report. In the last Saturday night, we <coughs> organized our one prayer meeting here in our our church, and uh, we invited uh, we invite the people from uh, Loving Muslim Together organizations. Also, the Frontier Canada, <coughs> and also some other organizations, and almost uh, 
25 peoples from different, different church and different, different uh, denominations, they participate there. And we was the host of this program. And uh, in this report, because that was a special day for the Muslims, they have a special night prayer, and they believe that this night, angels and spirit came from heaven. They wrote the good deeds and bad deeds of the people, and they also wrote what will be happen the next years. So they do all these things. That is their belief and faith. This we are different from there. The main thing is that uh, in this report, the Loving Muslim Together present report that uh, almost uh, 26,000 Muslims are here in Winnipeg. And this is the after the Punjabi Sikh people, that is the second largest group of the migrants people, and still people is coming. And they say that we are very less people who is approaching to them, who is uh, sharing the gospel with them, and who are connected with all of them. And if we will be calculate, maybe for roughly, they explain that uh, maybe 2,000 people and only one person who is uh, able to approach the 2,000 are Muslims here. Not a Punjabi, not a Hindu, just only to the Muslim because they approach there. And uh, we are also praying together that how we together work there. And uh, then I, I, exp I, I present the role of uh, Winnipeg Chinese Alliance Church, that how Chinese Alliance Church take an initial step and we are open that we will work together. And uh, now is the time that we need to work together and we oppose to them, make a good strategies and good plannings to share the gospel with all of them. Every month we decide that every month we will organize our one meetings and uh, we will be, everyone who is uh, working among the Muslim community will be share their reports and will encourage to others peoples in the groups and we will <coughs> share the, all the different new new strategies that how we can approach to them. Keep all of us in your prayer. Thank you. just want to share with you what God had reminded me this week. I already shared with the youth on Friday because they have a sharing time. It's so good. Every Friday, uh, Wilfred leads them and Chung leads them in a time of sharing and prayer. So, you know, I felt, you know, like, I, you know, so I shared with them what God reminded me this week. Um, I went to visit my aunt as usual every week, right? So... Uh, we've been reading the, uh, the, the, the calendar, as I was t mentioning to you, because the eyes are not that good. The Bible is getting a little hard to read. So we read the church calendar that has got verses. So we read every month, the 12 months. We flip the pages. She looks at the pictures, read the Bible verse. And this time, last time she read John 3.16 a few times, this time she kept reading and reading and reading. Um, and she looked at me after the second time and said, and I know what she's trying to tell me. Why aren't you reading? So I go, okay. <laughs> My Chinese uh, is okay. But after hearing you read John 3.16, I can pretty much follow along. So we kept reading and reading. And um, to see her... Read John 3.16. It's very touching. Like I've read John 3.16. You know, we all know it. It's a Bible verse that we all know and all the youth, the children memorize in church. But I've never seen someone read it that touches her heart so much. She was full of gratitude. Um, she, I can see that she feel blessed and to a point her eyes were um, watery, like you can see how blessed she feels. And that moment, God reminded me that this is how reading God's word is supposed to be. You know, I learned from my aunt, she's 97, you know, like, and still going strong, per se, you know. Like, so it's really touching to, to, hear, to hear someone read the Bible like that. 
and I thank God for reminding me that every day as I read, uh, we've been going through Exodus, as I read the Bible, um, that God would touch me, that I would feel blessed the same way as she is, that it will be fresh again, not something that, oh, I've read that before. So I thank God for that, and I thank God that every time I go visit her, I learn something. She is so, she feels so blessed and a total different person from the person I knew all along. Thanks. Okay. Um, so yeah, actually, I want to build on um, what Ivy was sharing. Um, I'm glad you kind of shared that as well. Because um, I was going to start by saying, yeah, at GCY, we often share about um, our weeks and uh, our God moments. And I didn't get to share this on Friday because it wasn't until yesterday that I did a bit of Sabbath um, where our small group is going through a bit of a Sabbath uh, exercise. And so I did some reflection and actually um, the, the words fresh perspective actually came up over and over again during my quiet time. Um, and I'm glad that Ivy, you talked about um, you know, reading the Bible being fresh, because uh, that was one of the examples that uh, resonated on me um, yesterday. So um, just to share really quickly, um, this past week at uh, GCY, we're going through the Awana study, uh, uh, Bible study, um, and the topic is on servanthood. Uh, and um, the Bible passage itself was from Luke chapter 5, where Jesus calls the disciples to, uh, to follow him. And so it's, you know, the story of, of Simon and, and uh, Peter, or Simon is Peter, uh, eventually. Uh, but uh, he, Jesus asks him to go onto the boat um, and preach from there. And afterwards, uh, Jesus uh, asks uh, Simon to cast his net uh, off the side of the boat, even despite having... Um, uh, a night of no fish, no success. Um, I've read the story many, many times before, just, you know, growing up in the church, and you're like, okay, yeah, sure, right? Uh, disciples end up following him um, afterwards, and, um, uh, you know, you, you hear it, but it doesn't become real for you. And coincidentally, actually, for small group last week, we were watching uh, The Chosen. So um, I know my wife tells me all the time, you should watch the show, it's really, really good. Navi says the same thing, too. Uh, and so as part of our small group, we watched it, and... Uh, coincidentally, by the power of God, I don't know what it is, we actually watched that particular episode. Um, and uh, it gave me goosebumps watching that because it gave me a fresh perspective on the, the perspective of what Jesus was experiencing. And they did it really, really well because uh, Jesus is not this stoic character uh, that we often kind of think about in the Bible where, you know, he performs miracles. He's not standing there just being stoic. He, he he had emotions. He had this conviction in his heart. And when the miracle happened, there was a sense of relief that you could see on his face. And then from Simon's perspective, that, that expression of bewilderment uh, was, um, and that transformation that he had, like, oh, I am completely skeptical of this individual telling me to throw my net off the side of a boat near the shore. And all of a sudden, all this fish come, and uh, it, it basically almost capsizes the ship. And so that gave me that, that uh, the impression that like, we, we tend to think about our, our daily lives as sort of like the, you know, the ho-hum um, things that we're familiar with, right? We, we tend to see things um, and we kind of go about our day. Uh, but God's actually working in our lives a lot where there, he's providing us a different perspective on different things. Um, so whether it's, um, you know, uh, Ivy had shared about um, her reading John 3.16 in Cantonese, providing her a different perspective, or seeing um, visually uh, a story of God from the Bible from a different perspective. Um, and even this past weekend, we were, uh, we've been meeting with our pastoral uh, candidate for children's and youth ministry as well, and talking about things that have happened within our church, those challenges that we have, um, and her asking questions and prompting me to think, oh, that's interesting. It's a different perspective. And so I guess the, the encouragement I want to give you guys is that God's always reaching out to us, always talking, um, prompting us to think about things a little bit differently. And so um, as we're kind of going through this season of change within our church with, um, you know, finding pastor pastors, um, figuring out what, uh, you know, uh, Encompass looks like in the future, um, even things for you professionally or within school, um, it helps to, to spend time in prayer and reflection and seeing things from a different perspective. So just want to share that with you guys.
Thank you, everyone, for uh, sharing your stories and sharing the, um, how God is working in your life to draw you closer to him and for you to realize just how lovely his message is. When we read it, we're always trying to gain a f fresh perspective. And um, it's, just, it's just wonderful and, and heartening for me to see and, and to, to experience. Uh, please rise. We're going to continue worshiping our Lord. Please be seated. So for those who haven't seen The Chosen, uh, you might be wondering a little bit what caused people to go aga-aga about. Um, I won't tell the story of how I came to see The Chosen by accident, but it was one of those little internet pop-up things. And uh, it's just made me realize that there are things that I don't understand just by reading the Bible without context. 
And one of the magic things about why it's so important for you to come here and listen to a sermon and listen to a message is because it's trying to show you what was going on in the minds of the people at the time that caused them to realize that Jesus is the Christ. Not was the Christ. He is the Christ. He still lives, and he's still living. So that's the f wonderful thing about interpretation. Now, there are many people who have different ways of interpreting. Okay, so then you sit back and think, well, is this genuine or is that genuine? And that's why God calls you to read Scripture and read it and try to understand where he is coming from to you. Now, when the Bible was written, it wasn't this one document that a whole bunch of people got together over a thousand millennia and just said, hey, we're going to write this book and it's all going to be about God and it's all going to make sense. This was individual, well, for our, for our book, 66 books, individually written by people who are inspired by the Holy Spirit to write, this is God for you at this moment. So the Pentateuch was the first five books of what we call the Old Testament, and that was written by Moses, although whether it's Moses or just people scribing for Moses, nobody knows. But it was the stories of the Jews as they came out of, of how they came to be and how they got to be chosen. And that's where we get the title of the, of the TV show, The Chosen. This, this TV show, uh, which is available on many different platforms, is not because it's about Jesus, right? Well, Jesus is the same character, the, ma the main character, but it's not really about Jesus. It's about the people who were chosen to follow Christ. When you sit back and try to figure out what are the stories of the individuals when they come to learn about Christ, you now come to realize just how applicable the Bible is to you. And that's what the magic of this past week has been for me. The fact that I could sit and read the Bible unhindered by all the other distractions of life and you suddenly realize how thirsty you are for this word. How, how real this word is to you and how it grounds you, how it makes you realize, my goodness, this actually answers my questions of what I'm doing with my life. So today, we have a scripture that we're going to read. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse, uh, verses 1 to 23. The version we have up on the screen is from NIV. And I, I try to read scripture in a manner that allows me to understand it in my manner of understanding. And when I read scripture, this particular one, for example, Ephesians was written by Paul as a letter to other Christians. Now back then, we didn't have, they didn't have internet. They definitely didn't have internet. They didn't have electricity. <laughs> they didn't have um, uh, uh, books of the Bible that were already formed. They didn't have a Bible. They just had individuals who witnessed the risen Christ and through their sharing, were able to tell other people, this is Christ. He is the one that's come to save us. So now, one person couldn't be anywhere all at once because they didn't have, right, internet, right? They can't feel like Zoom meetings and be halfway around the world instantly. But they had the letters. And when the letters were sent out to other places, they represented what that person was trying to share with them to those people at that time. So this is a letter from Paul to the people in Ephesus, or Ephesians, the Ephesians who lived there. And now, as I tried to read NIV, I must tell you, it's a little hard to read in the vernacular, meaning the read the way we understand it. So I'll, uh, the, the scripture on the, on the screen is going to be an NIV. Feel free to read it if you wish. I'm going to read NLT. And you can compare it using your biblical scholar knowledge kind of thing, how similar the words are. And then what I'm going to do, remember we're talking about fresh perspective. I'm going to read it one more time afterwards in message version. Message version is a, is, a, is a translation, but it's more of a transliteration in terms of the spirit of what was going on. But it is commonly spoken with using words that we understand today. So forgive me. I'm going to take a little bit of liberty with this. I'm going to read scripture twice. This is the word of God. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be the apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you peace and grace. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. 
This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which was to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose was that we Jews who were first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray to you constantly. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. And I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead, seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now, he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world but also in the world to come. God has put all these things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. A little different, eh? Different perspective, but still the same message. And now I'm going to read to you the message. Feel free to follow again from the beginning if you want. But I find it, and, and different people read different ways. Some people read better. Some people listen better. This message would have been written or would have been spoken to you being read from a letter. So pretend you're back in Ephesus, back in the first century, uh, not first century, the first hundred years, right? And uh, listen to the words of God. This is the letter from Paul. I am under God's plan as an apostle, an agent, a special agent of Jesus Christ, writing to you faithful believers in Ephesus. I greet you with the grace and peace poured out into our lives by God our Father and our Master, Jesus Christ. How blessed is God. And what a blessing He is. He is the Father of our Master, Jesus Christ, and takes us to the high places of blessing in Him. Long, long before He laid down earth's foundations, He had us in mind, had settled on us as the focus of His love to be made whole and holy by His love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. Because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the Christ. uh, uh, Sorry, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross. We are a free people, free of penalties and punishments chalked up by our misdeeds. And not just barely free either, abundantly free. He thought of everything, provided for everything we could possibly need, letting us in on the plans he took such delight in making. He set it all before us in Christ, a long-range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up in him. Everything in deepest heaven, everything on planet Earth. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us, had designs on us for glorious living, part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and everyone. It's Christ in you. Once you've heard that truth and message and believed in it, this message of your salvation, 
found yourselves home free, signed, sealed, delivered by the Holy Spirit. The down payment from God is the first installment on what's coming, a reminder that we'll get everything God has planned for us, a praising and glorious life. And that's why when I first heard of the solid trust that you have in the Master Jesus and your outpouring of love to all the followers of Jesus, I couldn't help stop thanking God for you. Every time I prayed, I think of you and I give thanks. But I do more than thank. I ask, I ask God, our Master Jesus Christ, the glory of God, to make you intelligent and discerning in knowing Him personally, your eyes focused and clear so that you can see exactly what it is He's calling you to do, to grasp the immensity of this glorious way of life that He has for His followers. Oh, the utter extravagance of His work in us who trust Him. Endless energy, boundless strength. All this energy issues from Christ. God raised him from the dead and set him on a throne in deep heaven, in charge of running the universe, everything from galaxies to governments, no name, no power, exempt from his rule, and not just for the time being, but forever. He is in charge of it all, has the final word on everything. And at the center of all of this, Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts, by which he fills everything with his presence. Amen. Amen. So today's message will be given by Simon, who will share with us the building of a majestic, magical community. And uh, okay, sure. <laughs> Thank you, Navi, uh, for reading the the word of you know the the, the, the passage in, in several different versions. And uh, actually, you know, it's good to you know to be able to share with you again. And um, you know, it's been quite a while and uh, maybe three or four weeks now that I have a chance to, to do that. And actually through some, some of this thing is that, you know, I kind of lost some of the rhythm. So t this m message today was kind of harder to get started again. But, uh, you know, but this is um, the reason why we starting on today is that we're going to start a new series on the book of Ephesians. You know, the elders have chosen the ti you know, that, uh, a title, live, live Truth and Love Well, from Ephesians chapter 4, from 14 to 16. It said, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every aspect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So in order to fully comprehend the teaching, we're going to spend the month of April and May going through the whole book of Ephesians. The title of this message today is Building a Majestic, Magical Community. The community that we're building <coughs> is obviously the church. Encompass is not just a church under Winnipeg Chinese Alliance Church, but it's actually part of a majestic, magical church that Jesus Christ is building. Ephesians 4.16 said, describes the church where Jesus is the head that joins together with all who follow Jesus faithfully, a holy, mature group that binds together with love. It is a group that stands firm in God's truth and miss the ever-changing standards of the world. Is it possible? As a Christian, the expected answer must be yes, 
yet, we often have some kind of doubts lingering in our minds. So we're going to take a little bit of detour and look at some of the picture. When you look at this particular picture, what are you thinking? What comes in your mind? It looks like a kind of a desolate and ab abandoned place. You know, really, the column of your left, on your left side, is the focus. That single column that stands right up. And this is actually what's left of one of the seven wonders of the world, the Temple of Artemis. You can see a model of that, a temple that is built around 240 BC, 450 feet long, 220 feet wide, and 60 feet high. A temple that is built with white marble that dominates the city of Ephesus. The old city of Ephesus carries a lot of ancient history. It has been recognized as actually one of the UNESCO World Heritage Site since 2015. The remains of the city lies about 80 kilometers inland from the seaside city of Isma in Turkey. The Turkey Tourism said, Site said, as, a rec as the second most important city of the Roman Empire, Ephesus grew and prospered. It po its populace was educated and wealthy, while its buildings were richly decorated and celebrated the interests and good fortune of the inhabitants. Today, visitors come to see the city's impressive historical imprints for themselves. The city came to prominence under the ancient Greeks who built the famed Temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Though only one column remained in the temple today, it was said to be very grand and impressive indeed. After ebbs and flows in the city's fortune, Ephesus became a city under Roman rule in 133 BC and the capital of Asia Minor in 27 BC. This is seen as a historical turning point which flourished and became second in importance only to Rome within the vast Roman Empire. Ephesus is an important place in the New Testament. The city is mentioned in the book of Acts to the Revelations. Paul came with Priscilla and Aquila on this second missionary journey in Acts 18 and Acts 18. Then Paul left briefly. And Paul, Paul and, you know, then Paul returns in his third missionary journey, journey in Acts 19 to spread the good news, teach and pastor there for three years. Paul first went to the Jewish synagogue and then when he was rejected, he took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in a lecture hall. This went on for about two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who live in the province of Asia heard the word of God. Paul has indeed made a big impact. And Ephesus was an important political, educational, and commercial center, ranking with Alexandria in Egypt and Antioch in Pisidia in South, Southern Asia Minor. So what are the churches? What are the challenges that this efficient church efficient Christians face. We can learn that from some of the passages outside the book. The first challenge is that, you know, that we can see is that Paul met with the elders in Acts 20, and Paul gave them two warnings. In verse 29, he said, I know that after this I leave, salvage wolves will come in amongst you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own member, Man will rise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. Paul said that over time, people will forget the truth and others will come in and teach false truth to confuse and lead the church 
in the wrong direction. Then Paul also encouraged them in verse 35, he said, in everything I did, I show you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul wants the people that wants that the people not to only focus on themselves and forget to help the weak. A lack of love, a lack of concern, an importance of building a community together. More importantly, the words of John in Revelations 2 said this, 2, 4, and 5 has said this, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you have at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from his place. You know, Jesus points to a lack of devotion and a passion for the love of God among this people. And you know that the other one that we have just mentioned and looked at the picture was that the worship of Artemis dominated not only the landscape, but every facet of people's life. In Acts 19, the city clerk, clerk in verse 35 said that the Ephesians, the city of Ephesus, is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image. The silversmith Demetrius stirred up and riled up the entire city. Businessman, trades person, the wealthy, and the ordinary people whose livelihood depended on the trade, and even visitors linked together to form a formidable force. You know, as a habit of Paul, he would never ever mention the name of the idol the people are worshiped in his letters. But Artemis impacted everyone. It is like a visit to Niagara Falls. All the shops, eating places, names of the streets, and business signs all points to the fall. The huge waterfall draws and attracts people and dominates people's thinking and their lives. In Ephesus, the grandeur of the temple, the wealth and the worshipers that came from all over seeking blessings from these idols must have influenced people's lives. Artemis not only impacts business and commerce, but also spiritual life as well, because Artemis was one of the 12 Olympian gods in the ancient Greek religion. She received worship throughout the ancient world as the goddess of the hunt, the wildlife, and fertility. Followers of Artemis must brag about how great this goddess is. People who see a tangible result of this shining white marble temple from afar and everyone must pay some form of tribute to this goddess by a way of incense or her statue that they keep. The practice of sorcery was from the earliest time connected with the worship of Artemis. It was the center of all forms of magic arts for all of Asia. When we read the first prayer of Paul for the Ephesians that Nobby has read a couple of times from verse 3 to 14, we actually see Paul's reaction to this dominant challenge of Artemis. Paul worships the true God. This true God must be far superior to this false idol. Paul starts to list the greatness of God as Paul praises God in, his, in this prayer. While the worshiper of Artemis might have received an answer to their request, Paul says to the follower of Jesus of these nine things that he mentioned in his prayer. The first thing that he mentioned in verse three is that God blesses us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. It's not, he points that God is not only just on the earth, but he is overall and in the heavenly realm. Second thing that he points out 
is that God chooses us for a purpose in verse 4. In verse 5, God predestinates us. That means he has a plan for each and every one of us. And in verse 6, God accepts us as his sons and daughters. And that was has planned long ago for us to be his sons and daughters. And then verse 7, God redeems us or pay a price for each one of us. And verse 8, God lavishly pour his grace to each one of us. And then verse 9, God tells us his will, his plan. He's not doing it, and he's letting us know and join in his plan. In verse 11, God includes each one of us as part of his grand plan. We are not just a sideshow. We are part of his plan. And lastly, God guarantees our inheritance with his Holy Spirit living in us. Those are the nine things that Paul is said, these nine things are important for us to know and for the Ephesians to know because this is far superior than what you see in a white marble temple building. But people are pragmatic. They want tangible benefits. Paul talks about spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms that seems to be impractical and still years to come. But Paul clarifies that in verses 13 and 14, he said, Where, when you believe, you are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. Paul stressed that the Holy Spirit will make this heavenly spiritual blessings tangible for each one. When we believe and accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, God immediately gives us the Holy Spirit to live in us. The Holy Spirit is a down payment of what is to come. Jesus said in John 14 that the Holy Spirit is our helper and our counselor, stays with us until he comes back. John 16, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will tell us what sin is and how to do the right things with God. The Holy Spirit empowers us to live a resurrected life free of sin. And this Holy Spirit makes the heavenly promises something that we can experience on our, on our daily lives. After the praises, then, pray, then Paul prays for the Ephesians from verses 15 to 23. Paul knows that it is hard for us to fully comprehend the benefits without additional help. So Paul asks for God's help. There are three things that Paul particularly pray for. Paul gives, first, Paul gives thanks to those holy and faithful people in verse 16. These people have been separated by God, and they also kept themselves apart from the world of Artemis. Since they accepted Christ, they remained faithful to follow Jesus, even when the, they were opposed by the society and the people around them. Even though Paul worked extremely hard with his own dedication, Paul did not take any credit. This is God's amazing work. Secondly, Paul addresses the issue of how the efficient Christians can know God better. And Paul asks for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. You know, the NIV Bible capitalized the word spirit, which leads us to think that it is the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit has already been given earlier in verse 14. And so 
it is, seems to be a duplicate. Wayne Barber, a biblical scholar, said that these efficient believers are not that old in their faith. They are young Christians. They were influenced by the Greek thinking that everything you do, you have to do it yourself. You have to figure it out yourself. So Paul challenges by praying, oh no, you can't do it that way. I'm praying that God will give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation concerning the knowledge of God. He's leading them to a deeper understanding of God. But he's trying to show them it doesn't come from our own internet, intellect. It comes from the Spirit of God directly revealing that to us. Yes, intellect is important because God gives understanding. But it is the Holy Spirit doing the work in our personal life. When God opens our minds to a deeper understanding, like some of you have shared this morning, we are enriched not only in our knowledge, but we are built a deepening relationship with God. It is a humbling experience. We know that the external, God, <coughs> the eternal God exists, but then he literally jumps out of the page to show us his thoughts. And that's the relationship that is important. Not only do we know in our heads, but we also experience that in our lives. And the third thing is that Paul wants the efficient Christians to see the tangible results of their benefits. And so Paul prays that the eyes of the heart be enlightened so they can see intangible things that are often hidden. Hope, riches of the glorious inheritance, and God's incomparably great power. The heart in scripture speaks of the center and core of one's life, the seed of thoughts and moral judgment. In Greek culture, the seed of emotions would be in the intestines. The heart is the seat of understanding. The Greek word for heart used in verse 18 is actually in a singular form. So Paul is praying that each individual person's heart will get to know, will get to see all this. Paul prays that the believer would let God shine a light into the inner being so that each believer will know the hope, the inheritance, and the power, not only as head knowledge, but in their hearts, the very essence of their being. In fact, Paul is asking God to walk with each one of us individually because Paul knows that each one's path is slightly different. And as Paul has prayed and asked for this, we kind of realize that the efficient Christians 2,000 years ago were facing some significant challenges. Their culture, their environment, and their wealth are something that is almost similar to us in a sense. Being a holy and faithful Christian will meet significant opposition. They were hard pressed on every side to stand firm in Christ. Yet Paul was undaunted by this challenge. He sees an opportunity with a group of holy and faithful Christians by his side. Paul took them with him and had daily discussions with him with, until all the Jews and Greeks who live in the province of Asia had heard the word. Acts 20, 19, 30, and 31 tells of Paul's influence. He said even some of the officials, friends of Paul, sent him a message and asked him not to go into the theater. 
you know, Paul strengthened the relationship with the disciples and built the relationships with other people as well, with the officials. You know, Paul has the boldness to see beyond a small group of believers just surviving in a harsh, harsh environment. But Paul sees that the good news can be advanced under those circumstances. Before we close, our Bible's reading group has finished reading the New Testament, and we just finished the book of Genesis as well. There was an incident in Genesis 25 with Jacob that I want to, I want to encourage each other. Jacob has just returned to Canaan and was looking for a place to settle down. God told him to settle down in Bethel, but Jacob was worried because some of his sons had killed all the men in the town of Shechem. So Jacob has a decision to make. Would he and his household trust God and live under God's protection? Or would he trust many other gods? Jacob decided in Genesis 35, 2 and 3, he said, So Jacob said to his household, to all who were with him, Get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the days of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. His household agreed in verse 4. So, Jacob, so they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in the ears and Jacob buried them under the oak of Shechem. Then the amazing thing happened in verse 5. Then they set out, and the terror of God fell on the towns all around them so that no one pursued them. You know, through this particular experience of trusting God, Jacob learned two important lessons. Jacob built an altar and named the place El Bethel, El Bethel, which means God of Bethel. Later, then God appeared to Jacob and said to him in verses 11 to 13, and he said, God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you, and the kings will be among your descendants. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I also give to you, and I'll give you the land to your descendants after you. Then God went up with him at the place where he had talked with him. You know, the term God Almighty is the Hebrew word El Shaddai. You know, in building this majestic, magical community of faith in Jesus Christ, Paul has shown us the benefits that will last forever. These benefits are far greater than the once powerful seven wonders of the world that now reduce to just ruins. You know, last week, we celebrate Easter when this same Jesus who conquered death walked out of the tomb. He overcame death. And we know that Paul is reminding us that we have a God with incomparably great power for those who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rules and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is inv invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be heads over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. You know, yesterday in a meeting, we discussed the challenge that the young people are facing that we haven't discussed in a full church setting. You know, we are not experts in the field, but we are not afraid to talk about it, all the issues because we have a God who is far above all rule and authority, power, dominion, and Jesus Christ is that head. 
So in order for us to reap the benefits of this community, we must decide we must trust God alone or other things. Let us encourage each other to trust God alone. There's a prayer that we have often used to end our revival prayer meeting every Saturday morning. And it said, O oh God, with all our hearts, we long for you. Come, transform us to be Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, missioned, focused people, multiplying disciples everywhere. And I hope that this will be a model for each one of us to build this community. When we see challenges, whether it's hard or easy or difficult or whatever size that challenge is, let us come before God. Let us too chose to trust him and him alone. And as we walk, and we also need to walk with each other as a community together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you listen to us and that through Paul's prayer, he thanked for, for the faithful brothers and sisters who are here. And he also wants us to see, us to see, give us a spirit so that we can see his word comes alive. And also he's wanting us to understand what is the hope the inheritance and the power of this wonderful God who is not afraid, who have seen everything, who have and finally overcomes. And Father, we thank you. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen.
melody of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you jesus the name above every other name Father, we want to come before you and ask that you help us to be set apart from this world. As Paul has prayed, set apart us to be holy and faithful people. And Father, we pray that you give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we will know you better 
in this coming week. And also, Father, pray that give us that the eyes of our hearts be enlightened so that we can see intangible things, the hope in Christ, the riches of the glorious inheritance in heaven, and God's great power that can be demonstrated to each one of us. Bless us. Help us to be witnesses of you in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. to this service. This is your home, your church. People who worship the Lord Jesus, who are here just to be with you. We have uh, one announcement for sure. Uh, the second one uh, I'll mention first is that uh, we have our candidate for uh, uh, youth and, and uh, children's ministry candidating with us this weekend. It's wonderful to have had her uh, come and uh, and meet. You may or see her, you may not. Uh, her name is Carol. Um, we definitely uh, commit God in the process of what's going on and uh, hope that she feels that this is a place that she can call, uh, be called here. Uh, second, uh, we have a uh, message from Wilfred who will um, give a, a message about the upcoming spring retreat. Um, so not really a message, I guess, but um, just an announcement around spring retreat. We are officially about six weeks away until our spring retreat. Um, so you can see on the uh, PowerPoint presentation here that uh, it's May 18th to 20th. Um, the theme, um, as I mentioned in past announcements, is um, the same as our church theme, Live Truth, Love Well. If you move to the next slide, please. Uh, it is going to be at Providence College, um, so it's about, uh, you can't see in the map there, but it's about a 45 minutes uh, south drive away from the city, um, at, uh, located in uh, Otterburn. Um, if you Google Providence College, it may bring up an address in Winnipeg. That is not the location, so I just want to make sure that you guys are clear that uh, it is the uh, one that is outside of uh, the perimeter of the city. Wow, that is really, really small text. Okay, so <laughs> speaker is uh, Reverend Simon Lee. So he was a former pastor at uh, our church here, and he was a senior pastor at uh, Richmond Alliance Church for uh, many, many years. Um, uh, this year we are having um, a, uh, the, the adult track, I would call it, is gonna be joint between English and Mandarin together. And so um, a lot of the talks and uh, the themes that he'll be going through would be relevant for uh, both um, the English and the Mandarin congregations. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we've got um, Rick and Susan Kilbray. Um, they've come to our church before, um, and uh, they are international workers uh, working with the CNMA in Mexico, and so they're on furlough leave here uh, this year. Uh, we've had the wonderful privilege of um, having them join us this coming spring, uh, where Susan is going to be leading the children's program, and then Rick will be leading the youth pr uh, program as well. So. Um, uh, because they are dividing themselves up a little bit, uh, we're, we are looking for some additional volunteers just to help with the children's program um, and uh, with the youth program as well for various different, um, you know, uh, sessions. So um, if your um, heart is impressing on you to um, help serve in those areas, um, uh, mark it down on the registration sheet, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, but uh, yeah, we're looking at uh, to have um, our, just our church family uh, rally together to help um, serve one another in these various different programs. Okay, so next slide. Um, so um, my, many of you who have grown up in the church have said, oh man, Providence College, we've been there many, many times. Um, you know, and you're familiar with Bergen Hall. Um, and um, Bergen Hall actually burned down not that long ago. Um, it's been rebuilt at, into something really, really beautiful and really nice. So if some of you guys um, um, are thinking, oh, it's going to be a kind of, you know, run down, dumpy residential area, residence, uh, no, it's actually really, really nice. So um, some of the previews of some of the pictures that you see here, uh, this is the new building um, and some of the new meeting spaces that you see indoors. Move to the next slide. Um, 
again, really, really small, I think. Yeah. Um, so um, some of the planning committee members went out to uh, Providence College and uh, they took some pictures. Um, that one in the upper left-hand corner, that is the new lounge. It is fantastic looking. Um, I put in a good word that hopefully the youth program will be actually meeting in the lounge area so that we can hang out in the, the couches and the pool tables and stuff like that. So um, hoping that uh, crossing our fingers as we finalize the details, uh, we'll be able to finalize the, uh, the meeting locations as well. Um, some of the other meeting locations that you see here, um, really nice facilities. Um, you see the gymnasium um, is really nice. Um, and um, the food, as I had mentioned previously, um, we do have um, a really good selection of uh, meals, uh, both Chinese and Western, or Eastern and Western. Uh, and a question did come up, are the chefs Chinese? The answer is yes, they are. Um, so when you think about getting Chinese food, it's going to be, I think, authentic Chinese food that you're going to get. So um, if uh, there's no other draws to uh, come to the retreat, food might be one. All right. Registration details. As I mentioned, we are about six weeks away from uh, the retreat, and so uh, the registration deadline uh, is April 28th, so the end of this month. So today sort of marks the first day of our registration. Uh, full-time uh, registration, so this is for adults um, or, um, you know, kids uh, age 12 and above. Um, it's going to be $175 for two and a half days. Children ages 3 to 11 are going to be $100. Um, for part-time uh, registrants, um, if you do want to come in on Sunday only because of your work schedules or availability, um, that is also available as well. So adults are $80 and children are going to be $50. Moving to the next slide. We are trying to be uh, efficient this year. Um, so um, registration will be done digitally through uh, Google Forms. And so um, you guys can whip up your phones and a, you can take a picture or you know, get a link to the QR codes here. Um, I'll probably ask Michelle to put up the slide at the end of service as well so that you guys can um, uh, link to that as well. Um, so the first uh, QR code is for registration form, so just for registering for the, the weekend. Um, on that registration form, uh, there's also, um, you know, as I mentioned, options for volunteering as well. So that includes serving different things, different programs, but also giving rides as well. So if some of you guys need rides or have seats available, uh, mark that down. Um, if you have dietary restrictions or rooming accommodation um, requests, um, there's also space in the registration form to add that on as well. The second form that you see there, the informed consent form, is a waiver form for the children and youth. So if you do have family members that are younger that are attending the youth and children's program, uh, we do need to have a consent form that's signed uh, to um, um, ensure that uh, you know, church liability, blah, 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 gets uh, uh, tackled and addressed there. For those that don't have phones or prefer to have hard copies um, or submit their um, registration through uh, paper, um, I will have some forms available next week and um, I'll plunk myself down over in this area here where um, we can uh, get that filled out. Um, I'll, I'll probably even go as far as setting up a, a laptop or an iPad so that um, if those who um, prefer to register in person, online or digitally, um, we can do that as well. So um, that's basically, uh, yeah, the, the announcements I wanna share for this week related to spring retreat. So I think it's gonna be a great time. Um, I'm really, really excited about it and I'm hoping that uh, we can get a lot of you guys to come out uh, to experience a weekend together as well. Thanks. Changing topics really quickly, April 19th, um, youth, uh, our, our youth event. So we have a card making party um, April 19th in the basement. Um, we will be asking the youth to invite their friends to come out. Uh, they'll be making various different cards like for Mother's Day or mm -hmm, Father's Day, um, birthday or thank you cards or other things like that. Um, for Encompass uh, family, uh, you guys are also welcome to join as well. It'd be great for us to have you guys come um, just work with the youth together and just create some bridges together as well. So um, there will be a Google form that uh, we will be rolling out probably in the next day or so. So check the website for uh, announcements for the link. Um, because of materials and all that kind of stuff, uh, we want to make sure that uh, we um, can, um, you know, we're, we're planning for approximately 30 people uh, to attend the card making event. So um, if you are interested in attending, please register so that uh, we can uh, plan materials appropriately. 
Um, so again, that is April 19th, which is a Friday night, 7.30 to 9.30 in the church basement. Thanks. I know you didn't think it was a message, but I thought that was a pretty much of a long message there. <laughs> Lots of info. That's good. If you guys have any questions, Wilfred's over there. Uh, the deacons uh, do have other information uh, if you want to ask further questions. Uh, will that QR code or some kind of link be on the website? You'll get it up there? Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, blessings to you all, folks. Uh, please uh, greet each other with a uh, holy welcome, and uh, we look forward to seeing you guys again next week. God bless.